Welcome, students, to our third lecture of Chapter 17, which I've divided into two separate PowerPoint presentations. During this one, we're going to talk a little bit more about amine substitution reactions. After studying the second part of this chapter, you should be able to know how to use the Gabriel synthesis and hydrogenation of alkyl acides to make primary amines, know the mechanism and products of nitrile hydrolysis, know how to use nitrile hydrogenation to make primary amines, know how to activate carboxylic acids, and apply all of this knowledge to total synthesis. Each of these numbers, 17.18, 19, 20, and 21, are the sections in your textbook that cover each of these different topics. In this section, we will also learn about fats, oils, soaps, detergents, and micelles and how nature activates carboxylic acids. We'll of course skip section 17.23. Back in chapter 10 we talked about how you can alkylate ammonia, NH3 shown here, to get primary amines like this. In other words, I could take ammonia and have the lone pairs on the nitrogen attack the alkyl group, kick off an alkyl halide, and generate an ammonium salt. When I neutralize that salt, I then get a prim primary amine, as shown here. Question is, do you think I could use this reaction to get a primary amine as my major product? The answer is unfortunately no. This would be a fantasy. I'll now explain why. In reality, alkylating ammonia is actually a very crappy way to make primary amines because it's almost impossible to stop the nitrogen from over-alkylating over like this. You get the nitrogen stirring with excess alkyl halide. You get a mixture of monoalkylated amine or ammonia, dialkylated ammonia, trialkylated ammonia, and quaternary ammonium salts all in mixture. You neutralize these three, you end up getting a mixture of primary, secondary, and tertiary amines along with isolated ammonium salts as a precipitate. So the question is, is there anything that we can do to isolate primary amines as our major product? The answer is yes. You can use the Gabriel synthesis. This is the Gabriel synthesis. We begin with this compound, which is called thalimid. I love how there's a pH and a th next to each other. I wish we could have more phs and ths next to each other more frequently. We could call it thalimid. In any event, you start with thalimid and treat it with hydroxide base. This deprotonates the nitrogen here, giving you a nitrogen anion. When this is stirred with alkyl halide, this nitrogen anion then attacks the alkyl group kicks off the halogen and gives you a singly alkylated a substituted imid intermediate. Now look at this. You think this compound right here is going to alkylate that nitrogen more than once? The answer is no. Not to a, any large extent anyway. As it turns out you can take this intermediate, treat it with acid, water, and heat, and then liberate phthalic acid and this ammonium salt that has a single alkyl group attached to the nitrogen. When neutralized with base, that gives you a primary amine as your exclusive major product. Now I've got a question. What alkyl bromide would you use in a Gabriel synthesis to prepare each of the following amines? As I'm going to discuss the answers to these questions on the next slide, it might be advisable for you to pause here and see if you can do them on your own. Here are the answers. The first amine in the question that I want to get is pentylamine. How would I do this using a Gabriel synthesis? Well, of course, I would begin with thalimid. I would treat it with hydroxide. This hydroxide deprotonates the nitrogen, giving me a nitrogen anion. Because I want to end up with pentylamine, I'm going to react it with pentyl bromide. This then makes it so that the nitrogen anion attacks the carbon bound to the bromine and kicks off bromide as a leaving group, giving me this intermediate. When I take this intermediate and react it with acid, water, and heat, 
it liberates my primary amine as the major product. So what's the summary of this reaction? The overall reaction is thalamid reacted in step one with hydroxide and pentylamine and step two acid, water, and heat. As we address the other, sub, or the other questions, we could basically do the exact same thing. All we have to do is alternate the identity of the alkyl bromide that we're adding to match the product that we want. The second question asks how we could get isohexylamine. So I'm going to stir thalimid, step one with hydroxide and isohexyl bromide, and step two HCl water and heat to liberate the primary amine as isohexylamine. The next question asks how I could get benzylamine. Now you should remember that a benzyl is a, uh, a, a name we give to a benzene ring that has a CH2 attached to it. So this product right here is benzylamine. If I want to form that, I stir thalimid with hydroxide and benzyl bromide. This is an abbreviation for that. And then take that intermediate and treat it with HCl water and heat. It liberates the primary amine as my major product. The last one is to treat thalimid with hydroxide and cyclohexyl bromide, followed by HCl water and heat to liberate my primary cyclohexylamine as the major product. As it turns out, there are other ways of making primary amines. This is a great way. What you can do is take an alkyl halide, like this alkyl bromide, and treat it with this compound, sodium azide, NaN3. Azide is actually N3 with the minus charge on one of the nitrogens. It displaces the bromide to give this, which is called an alkyl azide. If you take that alkyl azide, which I've drawn the full structure here, and react it with hydrogen and palladium carbon, it will hydrogenate this nitrogen and leave you your primary amine exclusively. Another great way of making carboxylic acids is to hydrolyze nitriles. Here's the overall reaction. If I take a nitrile, as shown here, and I treat it with acid, water, and heat, I can convert this carbon from a nitrile carbon into a carboxylic acid carbon. Now you guys might have forgotten from earlier how to even make a nitrile. A very great way of doing it is by taking an alkyl bromide and treating it with cyanide nucleophile. The, carb, uh, the negatively charged carbon comes in, kicks off the bromide leaving group, and gives you your nitrile. So this is an excellent way to take alkyl bromides and convert them in two steps to carboxylic acids. Here's a poorly drawn mechanism of nitrile hydrolysis, which I borrowed from our textbook. I'm not going to cover these verbally, but I invite you to look at this mechanism yourselves, and if you have any questions, you can address uh, me in class. Another way of making primary amines is to hydrogenate a nitrile. In order to hydrogenate a nitrile down to a primary amine, I don't use palladium carbon as I would an azide. Instead, I use hydrogen gas and rainy nickel. Now I want to teach you how to activate carboxylic acids. As we've discussed earlier in this chapter, OHs aren't the best leaving groups. Is there a way then to convert an OH into a more reactive leaving group? The answer is yes. We've mentioned this before, but you can take a carboxylic acid and convert the OH into a CL by treating it with thionyl chloride, which I affectionately refer to as SOCL2. You can also uh, make the same conversion by treating your carboxylic acid with phosphorus trichloride, or you can convert the carboxylic acid into an acid bromide by treating it with phosphorus tribromide. One thing that's useful about this is that chlorides and bromides are hot leaving groups, which means that you can take these products and displace these halogen atoms with a number of nucleophiles that would not be able to displace an OH quite as easily. 
The end goal of my teaching you all of these reactions is, of course, for you to apply them to total synthesis. I'd love to show you a bunch of examples of total synthesis here, but if I did that, then we wouldn't have as much stuff to cover in class. So I'm going to save those for, in, uh, our, uh, for when we're together in class. Now I want to just review a couple of really cool examples of carbonyl compounds being used in real life, just for the fun of it. Just so you guys know, this is the structure of fats and oils. The only, the only practical difference between a fat and an oil is that fat is a solid at room temperature, and an oil is a liquid at room temperature. What in the world makes something solid versus liquid at room temperature? Well, as it turns out, it is the identity and structure of these three R groups. Generally speaking, the longer and the larger these R groups, the more likely it is going to be a solid at room temperature. If you have more branching in these R groups, then it tends to contribute to it being a liquid more. And if you have, of course, short R groups here, then it becomes uh, more and more likely that it will be a liquid. Structurally speaking, though, the generic structure for fats and oils are the same. As it turns out, you can take a fat or an oil, heat it with water and sodium hydroxide, and the hydroxide will come into this carbonyl at each of these positions. Electrons go up, electrons go down, and they kick off and liberate the oxygens. That gives you this product, glycerol, and these three structures. As it turns out, these structures are the structures of soap. So each individual soap that you might use or see or have heard of might have a different R group attached here, lending to its different structure. But this is, in reality, how soap is made. As it turns out, long ago, soaps were often made by people in the frontier regions of the world by taking fats from animal fat and heating it with hydroxide obtained from lye and water to then liberate these sodium salts. These sodium salts are, of course, soaps. I want to teach you now the difference between soaps and detergents. While I realize one of the differences is that detergents has more syllables and different letters, there is also structurally a difference. A typical soap has a carbonate or a sodium carbonate head. Now you can have soaps that have different counter ions other than sodium that will lend to different structures as well. Detergents have sulfonate anionic heads instead. They also can have alternative counter ions instead of sodium, such as potassium or magnesium or calcium, for example. But this structurally is really the only difference between soaps and detergents. Functionally, they do function differently. And you can, uh, you've probably experienced that as you've used soaps in your personal lives and detergents and seen that detergents do tend to remove uh, filth in a different way either better or worse than soaps, depending on the problem at hand. You might ask the question now, how do soaps work? Well, as it turns out, if we go back to our previous slide, you can see that soaps and detergents both have a carbonate or sulfonate head. This head is very, very polar, which means it likes water. That is, it's hydrophilic. Both soaps and detergents also have big, long hydrocarbon chains. These chains are very, very nonpolar, which means that they don't like water. They're hydrophobic. When you get soap molecules together, what they typically do is form these spheres in which the carbonate, that is the polar heads, are pointed outward, and these big, long, greasy, Car, uh, hydrophobic tails are pointed inward. This type of spherical structure is called a micelle. This is what soaps do when they're exposed to water. All of these carbonate heads point out, outward toward the water, 
and all of these greasy, hydrophobic tails point inward. This is the reason why soaps and detergents can remove nonpolar things. See, as it turns out, if you look at your hands and they're dirty, the dirt is actually a mixture of lots of different compounds. Many of those compounds are polar, and many of them are nonpolar. If I take dirt or grease or something else on my hands and I put water on it, what's going to happen is the water, because it's polar, is going to easily wash or rinse away all of the polar molecules in that mixture. However, the water will not be able to rinse away very easily, or at all, any of the nonpolar compounds in that mixture because they are not hydrophilic. That is, they don't dissolve in water. Soap and detergent sort of have the best of both worlds. They have these polar heads and these nonpolar tails. So when they form these spherical micelles, what occurs is the nonpolar tails point inward and grab anything that's nonpolar stuck to your hands or your clothes or whatever else you're washing, while the polar heads point outward and grab hold of the water molecules. This enables soap to stick to nonpolar things while also being able to be rinsed away by the polar water. The next subject I want to address is how nature activates carboxylic acids. As I mentioned, the OH groups in carboxylic acids are not the best leaving groups. Nature, uh, in living organisms including us, has to have the ability to remove OHs and replace them with other things very, very frequently. How in the world does it do that? Well, what happens is nature often replaces OHs with these groups, which are called phosphate groups. You might uh, have seen structures like this in biology courses. This is an acyl phosphate, an acyl pyrophosphate, when there, there are two linked phosphate moieties, and an acyl adenylate. This is where there's an adenyl moiety attached to your phosphate. These triphosphate structures should look familiar because they're found in ATP. This is the entire structure of ATP. It has an adenosine, a sugar moiety, and this triphosphate backbone. Triphosphate backbone attached to the adenosine moiety can be shorthand written as this. One question you might ask then is what in the world does nature do with these phosphate groups? Well, it likes to sequester ATP in various sites inside cells and other tissues. And then, when a carboxylic acid needs to be activated, the deprotonated acid can attack one of these phosphorus atoms and then displace these electrons to free up an ADP, which is adenosine diphosphate you then have formed an acyl phosphate, which is an activated carboxylic acid. This phosphate group is a much better leaving group than the OH group. An alternative way of replacing an OH with a phosphate group is by taking this deprotonated carboxylic acid and having it, it attack the central phosphorus atom in ATP. This releases adenosine monophosphate and replaces the OH with a pyrophosphate group. A pyrophosphate group is also a much better leaving group than an OH. A third way, of course, as you might have anticipated, is to have the deprotonated carboxylic acid attack the third phosphorus. And upon doing this, it, also, it generates an acyl adenylate and releases pyrophosphate as the leaving group. This ends our discussion for chapter 17. I hope it's been as exciting and as long for you as it has for me. Stay tuned for chapter 18 videos which will be posted very soon.